Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. This is the podcast for the third Sunday of Lent, which falls on March 7th in 2021. Our reading is from Exodus 20, verses 1 through 17, the Psalm number 19, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 18 through 22, and the Gospel is John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. Oh my God. We're back in John. <laughs> That's the best, um, Caroline. That's, that's the best part of the year of Mark, year B. A lot of, a lot oh, of John. Oh, it's the year of Mark and John. John already has a year and it's year B. <laughs> no, that's not true. Yes. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's nice try, Matt. Uh, no, that's not, I like Mark. I like Mark a lot, but I really, really, really love John. All right, so uh, the... So who wants to start? Caroline. <laughs> you're yes. so funny. Uh, you're hilarious. So actually, uh, when we were thinking about, uh, when we were talking so much last week about praise uh, and worship, that that's one entry into this text that you could that you know you could continue this idea and we ended the podcast last week in terms of what does it mean to praise god and how do we praise god and how do we worship god uh particularly in this moment in time where our usual constructs and locations and and ways of going about worshiping God have, have changed so drastically. We're not in God's house, if you will. And so we have this language of, you know, the church has left the building, uh, but at, at the end of the day, God has left the building and God was never in the building. And that's the point of John too, uh, and the temple incident in John. And so uh, that this passage sets up that question that, that uh, goes forward in John of, of that recognition of, and there's, a, there's quite a bit of irony in that zeal for your house will consume me. Uh, it's zeal for what house and, 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 and whose house. And of course, it's not a house at all, but it's, uh, it is, it, it's this recognition of, that uh, that Jesus is the you know is the location of God, and so one of the ways that you can um, and there's irony in the sign too. The sign is right in front of you. It's the body, <laughs> it's the incarnated word. And so going forward, then uh, the same question then is asked of the Samaritan woman, or and she asks Jesus actually, where should we worship? Uh, in John 4, and Jesus says, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. In John 5, the man who was uh, healed, who has been ill for 38 years, Jesus finds him in the temple worshiping and uh, says, you know, uh, and there's a corrective there, which seems like he's, you know, uh, uh, kind of rebuking the guy, but he's not. He's saying, no, 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 no. I mean, you're doing the right thing. You're worshiping. God, because only God can do what I did for you, but I'm right here. And then in John 9, the man born blind uh, says, Lord, I worship you. And so that's the, I think there, 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 a lot could be done with that direction uh, in thinking about worship and, and the, that, that the whole point of this passage is uh, it, and it being moved here is to recognize that God is not in the building. God is not in the temple. God is, uh, God is right in front of you in Jesus embodied in Jesus. And so how do we, how do we help people think about, yeah, God has left the building. God was never in the building. God is, uh, is, is among us in this incarnated flesh. So that's, one connection that I had, particularly as we, uh, as we had talked about that uh, last week. What a wonderful set uh, for this text, Caroline. And uh, I think of a couple of weeks ago, Ralph, when you talked about um, um, Isaiah and Amos sort of having problems with worship 
Uh, and uh, the uh, I, I think that the problem was not with worship, but as is here, uh, that Caroline's kind of set us to pay attention to, that it's not that God is located in this one place, but that God has chosen to wander in the wilderness with us, to be where we are in our moment of reality, to be with us uh, wherever uh, we find ourselves. And I think in in uh, this, um, uh, you know, post-2020 reality, um, this that's a very important uh, homiletical way to approach this text. There's such hard passages in all four gospels of so this, whatever happened with Jesus in the temple. I can, I, I'm still a little confused about how the criticism here is the assumption that the temple is the location of the divine because Jesus seems here mostly concerned about commerce. I guess- oh, I, if, I don't, oh, go ahead, Joy. Uh, I'll, I'll leave because I'll let you say uh, uh, something wiser when I, when I close my mouth. Um, uh, I, 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 I hear what you're saying in that, uh, uh, Matt. Um, the, the reason I think it's a criticism is because that's exactly what's wrong with the space that we claim we are being faithful and worshiping God in. We're not. Um, if we talk to this about the preparation for Easter as uh, the commentator did, um, we do just as much of this commercialized um, uh, capitalistic gain in preparation for the service, and we do not prepare our hearts um, to be in the presence of God. And uh, I was jumping on what Caroline was saying in light of this, because it takes us away from being critical of selling church, you know, paraphernalia or selling anything in the church um, today that we've used to resemble um, the driving out of the sellers that Jesus was doing uh, uh, it here, that is recorded here. And it reminds us that we've done the same thing and we can worship God where we are. And maybe we've lost the understanding of where is the place that God is. That that was that was what I took from what Caroline was saying. I do well, think. I, oh, go ahead, Barrow. I think it's there, Matt. I I mean, if you uh, if you disagree, that no no worries, obviously. But that the, the implicit criticism is there that Jesus is the presence of God, uh, and saying when it says um, he was speaking of the temple of his body. And uh, the the Christ, our our Christological claim does come with a with a um, problem for uh, for Jewish Christian relations that if Christ is the, the presence of the living God in the flesh and blood, which is then made available wherever two or three are gathered in His name, that means it is not where um, at least Second Temple. Jews would have claimed the, the privileged place of God's presence is. I have never had this conversation with any of my Jewish friends, which uh, actually I need to do now. Um, I want to take us a different, Caroline, do you want to say anything about that before oh, I take only, us in a slightly only, different direction? Yeah, only to say that, uh, that I think John's version of this, that's what we really have to pay attention to, that uh, I, I think I would disagree with the commentary online or just call it, I don't know that Jesus is angry. I don't know that there's rage here. And I don't know that there's um, criticism, actually. Uh, that's, you know, we get that more in the synoptics of stop making my father's house a den of thieves or a den of robbers, uh, of, of, of maybe naming corruption that is happening. That's not Jesus' point here at all. The point is to see... Um, to, and when and the preacher has to be really really careful for this because with this because it can sound like uh, Jesus is is coming in to nullify completely the temple, uh, and uh, this is not this is this is, that's not what's happening. What's what Jesus is calling attention to, as you said, Rolf, is that the location of God. Uh, God is now um, enfleshed and incarnated in Jesus. And, uh, and so the question is, will, do people recognize that? Will people see that? 
And so that, yeah, that, that's the only thing that I was going to say. So I don't, I don't know that it's. Um, what does yeah. he mean by calling it his father's house then? What in, oh, stop making my father's house a marketplace. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, to what extent he's naming the, um, the, yeah, you, you say it, it is my father. I don't think, well, how do I answer this? I don't, it's to what extent it's still the temple and it's still the reality of, of, of how is it that we, um, how is it that we worship God? Uh, but to what extent God, uh, Jesus is calling attention to a different kind of reality. Um, and uh, can I ask what I think is a helpful question along that line, Caroline? Yeah. Um, so they say, what sign can you show us for this? Mm -hmm. What does what does sign mean in John? Is my question, because it seems like his answer then is my crucifixion. Um, oh, no. without saying that, well, because he says, yeah, destroy this temple, meaning his body. It says, and in three days I will raise it up. Isn't he saying the sign that you're asking for is my body? Yeah, but the body, uh, I would suggest that yeah, the, that the sign- a, I ask questions that, I don't know the answer to. <laughs> that, the, that the raising up here is uh, the entirety of the incarnated event. So we have a tendency to say the raising up is only uh, the, the crucifixion when in fact, the raising up also happens in the resurrection and the ascension. So for John, it's all three. It's the entirety of the incarnation is the sign uh, and that is located in Jesus' body. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, my father's house, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, um, it, I, I think in a way what it points to is uh that connectivity that Jesus is trying to make between who he is and who, who God is uh, that we saw back in 118. So um, I don't know if that helps, but. Helps me a lot, thank you. Mm -hmm. Matt? Oh, I, 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 got, I got nothing else except to say that, again, this is a passage that can be used to help people prepare for, for crucifixion, that there's something here about death, resurrection and ascension that's not just the unfortunate end uh, to Jesus' life or doesn't launch plan B, but is somehow um, a deliberate aspect of, of who he is and what he's come to do. And like all the other passages we've examined so far in Lent, this doesn't give a complete answer or all the answers, but it does start to, um, it, it gives us some raw material to start to construct an, an, an understanding of where Lent is headed and how we should approach the crucifixion. I have, and what follows from a Johannine and Lucan point of view. Yeah, it's it's the whole incarnation. It's the whole shebang. That, should be, that yeah. should be the name of your Easter sermon this year. Is the, the whole shebang. shebang. Yeah. That's and that, and that's, yeah, and that's where this passage is really helpful and a Johannine perspective uh, that it's not, that the incarnation is, uh, is, is the beginning point of what, of of where this story is going, and for John at least, that's that's the ascension, and that the the ultimate uh, the ultimate goal of being of I will bring all people to myself, uh, and not just the cross, but through the resurrection and um, preparing a place as in the ascension. So, it, it there's a there's a um, a wholeness to this. Uh, of, of a view of the incarnation that doesn't just focus on the death of Jesus, uh, but that that is a trajectory. I have two more things to say about this, and then we really need to move to other texts. The first thing I wanna say is the, the last four to five minutes um, is why this doing this podcast with you guys is um, one of the two best things about my vocation as a teacher at Luther is that it, it's where I, as a lifelong learner of scripture, learn um, because I didn't know those things that we just uh, teased out together. And when I say teased out together, means I asked you and you taught me. So I just want to say this is why also pastors, I hope, continue to do this kind of thing 
that every week we get to study the Bible and somebody actually pays us for it usually. Second thing I wanna say is this text has recently been used as um, uh, a text validating Christian violence that says Christ validates the violence you wanna do in society. I've seen it on the left and the right. And as a teacher of Bible, I reject that utterly. This text does not validate rioting. I saw it last summer validating rioting uh, after um, state-sponsored violence. That violence is wrong, and so is the violence that people have done. Christ, I don't see this passage as validating. I've seen this passage used recently to validate right-wing violence. So um, I don't know if you guys want to say anything else there, but this text does not validate your violence. Clearly, if we uh, piggyback on that, um, what was said, uh, I think it was last week, that um, who, who are we putting, uh, the, given the attention to? Is the, uh, the well, we were talking about what suffering, um, uh, you know, we were talking about this text can't, some people can say this text va validates suffering. And it's like, mm, no, this text turns our attention to God. And I think, Ralph, that's what you're pointing out. We're, this text, everything that we've said, those previous uh, points that you were piggybacking, everything we said is that this is pointing to the presence of God that is evident in the person of Jesus in the incarnation. And when we take this text as a validation for our behaviors, we miss the point completely. We miss the point that Jesus is making in calling attention to what is happening in the place that is to be the place of prayer and worship. And we miss the point of what Jesus is doing. Um, so I, 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 I think I probably didn't need to say that, Ralph, except for to say I, I appreciate you stepping into that because uh, uh, we can't currently need that. If I jump back a bit, uh, I think Caroline was uh, making this uh, mention about uh, uh, the whole world and, and this being an extension out. Uh, I'm going to use that as a way to lean into Exodus uh, 20, um, not just the newness. Um, I did this with Matt a couple of weeks ago, but the return to the intention. Um, in Exodus 20, uh, it's a very familiar passage, uh, and uh, the common, uh, commentary notes that we often take it out of its context. And uh, uh, Will Willimon once set this as a point of arrival, that it, his creative way of reading the text. He, he described this as a point of arrival at a retreat center. Um, where Moses is supposed to lead worship, and that's a direct read of, of God's call, you know, take my people on a journey uh, where they can worship me. And Moses is supposed to lead worship, and, and they get there, and they're ready, and then realizes that they don't have a denominational hymn, though. And, and so Will does this play where he says, Moses, Moses says, hold on, let me, let me go talk to God about how we're supposed to do this. And God starts saying, oh, yeah. Right. Well, let me see. Um, okay, now I'm your God, and you're only supposed to worship me. And, and Moses is like, time out. Um, we need something to do in the next 50 minute service. And God is like, shut up and write this down. This is going to be good. One of the places I love about Will Willimon. And, and then what God says right is a way of life. It, it's it's not 10 principles for success, but God provides a way of life that is an alternative to the culture that the Israelites have been living in for the past centuries. Um, a few years ago, Daniel Stevenson, one of my students, shared how one of his college professors opened the Ten Commandments by attending to that context. And I share it today because I think it's a brilliant way of looking at it. To a community whose national identity had been one of forced labor in a culture of oppression, disregard for human life, and power over moves born of ethnocentric narcissism. The creator of the universe prescribes a way of life that requires not 50 minutes once a week, but 24 seven action that says to liberated slaves, you're free. You're free to worship me 
the creator covenant in God who rescued you from oppression because I'm faithful to the promise made to your ancestors, the promise we talked about last week. And, and, and you're, you're mine. And, and you don't need to make an icon of me because I've already done that. It's you. That, that's what it means to be human. And, and, and you don't have to take the labels that your captives have given you because you are transcripts of the Trinity. And you're free to rest. And I mean, talk about countercultural. To slaves, you're free to rest. You're free to take a vacation. You're free to take a day off. In the rhythm of the way that I created the universe, you bear my image by taking us a regular rest. And you're free to honor your ancestors and the traditions they held dear. Your, your captors are wrong. Your heritage can be kept alive. And, and no lies that have been told about you or on you, you can now witness to your ancestors' truth about who I am and what I promised. And then that next batch, I'm going to stop preaching here because I just got excited remembering these two, two words. But that next batch is not just, but because of the relationship we have with God. Therefore, how are we free to live with one another? And we are free to believe that God has given us enough. So we don't have to take the life of anybody else. We don't have to covet the things of anybody else. We don't have to take more than what we have in our relationships. It's just a countercultural way of life rather than 10 laws to repeat uh, as a, a mantra once a week for 50 minutes. Okay, I'm done. Preach. <laughs> Thanks. I can't uh, get Sorry. <laughs> um, no, I love it. It's great. I have, a, I have a couple of responses. First of all, just to note the density of interbiblical interpretation going on there, that uh, the various pieces of the commandment are connected in that interpretation to other pieces of scripture. Um, Matt uh, uh, has suggested just noting the trajectory of covenants here. So two weeks ago, Noah, last week, Abraham. This is the context of the Mosaic covenant. Um, then we're going to have to skip next week. And in two weeks, we get the new covenant, Jeremiah. Uh, next week, I'm going to suggest David that people swap out the crazy story of Moses and the serpent, which is a great story, but crazy. Um, but just to Note the context here is of covenant. And you talked about joy is the 10 commandments are given and there's nothing like them else in ancient Near Eastern law. Having studied ancient Near Eastern law as part of my degree and then twice taught the 10 commandments class with two professors. I was the teaching assistant uh, at Princeton. Um, Pat Miller, my doctor father's written the magnum opus on the 10 commandments in, at least in English from a biblical perspective, um, there's nothing like the 10 commandments. And what they are is they are how people who have been freed by the living God live. Yeah, both of you have described how this is a gift, right? This is a, a, the perspective on the giving of the law is generosity, freedom, all of those things. Life, right? It's all meant to promote life. I mean. I'm cheating maybe and moving to Deuteronomy and some of that language there, but. Um. Well, even the reference though in the Sabbath commandment here is to creation, that it is mm -hmm. creation uh, needs Sabbath. Uh, God has built it into Sabbath, even for God's self. Um, yeah, I could say more, but we need to move on. That's life and relationship. Yeah, That's, uh, Psalm, Psalm 19 and Jim Lindbergh. I mean, come on, can you have a better combination? So I, I just urge people to read the commentary on uh, my teacher and uh, Jim Lindbergh's commentary on Psalm 19, which, um, you know, that's a top five Psalm for me. I think it was C.S. Lewis who called it one of the greatest lyrics um, in the history of world literature, something close to that. Uh, see my commentary in my Psalm commentary. I quote him, I'm sure, but uh, it's a, beautiful psalm the first half speaks about this 
ephemeral word of God that we can almost hear. Nature is preaching, but we can't quite hear it. So then God gives the word in the second half of the psalm, and that's why it's a great response to the Ten Commandments, is, but you have given us this clear word in Scripture in the Torah, and it's just so gorgeous. I love the way Eugene Peterson translates this one. Uh, in his paraphrase, we know as the message, where he describes uh, uh, this as um, uh, God's glory is on tour in the skies. God's craft on exhibit across the horizon. Madam Day holds classes every morning. Professor Knight lectures every evening. The words aren't heard, their voices aren't recorded, but their silence fills the earth with unspoken truth everywhere. I just want to stop there, but that's not good for a podcast. But Well, luckily, we it, it's a great place. It's beautiful. Thank you. Okay, my favorite passage in all of Scripture, uh -oh. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 and following, and therefore, I don't even really want to even talk about it because I think I could only fail to do it justice. But I'm sure I'll jump in after you guys. <laughs> I was going to say, you can't say it's your favorite piece and then have nothing. <laughs> something. Well, first of all, it's hard uh, because of the way Paul argues. I think, I think what Paul does is he gives, he, he, he's tracing out the essence of the theology of the cross, starting at verse 18. But then he supports each statement, and so it can be confusing. So the first tenet, right, is the word of the cross, right? Uh, I don't like message about the cross. I don't think that quite conveys both. It is the word about the cross, but it's also the word that the cross speaks. So the word of the cross is foolishness for those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. Then he supports that. Then he comes back to his next tenet in verse 21. Because in the wisdom of God, the world could not know God through wisdom. All right, so why is the cross the wisdom of God? It's because we cannot know God unless God reveals God's self to us in the cross. I mean, that's, that is where you have to start, is it is impossible to reason from observing creation to what God is really like. Impossible, oh, right? It's, because if you did, you would do what societies have done. Why are the powerful in charge? Well, divine right, baby. God put them there. You deserve to be oppressed. In fact, why are you oppressed? Some societies said, well, you must have sinned in a previous life. So, you, so suffer where you are. And the next life, you might be a little higher. I mean, so this is what some societies have done, trying to reason from the existence People do it to me. Why did you have cancer? Why do you not have legs? Must have been something you or your parents have done. I've talked about this. People have said this to me. People have said it to our former student, Beth, who was born without an arm. Um, told one of her parents that they sinned, that their kid was born. So that is, this is what people do, reason backward. You can't do that with God's nature, says Paul. If you want to know God's nature, there's one and only place to find it, and it is in the cross. Now, you can, uh, having said that, uh, one of you guys tell us, what do you actually learn from God then about God's nature in the cross? Well, that it's all, I mean, like you said, that it's all upside down and that, and it's, but it's not that, it's not that the cross as an expression of utter powerlessness from a first century perspective says that God is, let me back that whole thing up. It's not only to say that God is present in circumstances of powerlessness and suffering and misery. It is to say that, but it's also to say that those places are paradoxically the power of God at the same time. So it's not about a God who is powerless, who just comes to comfort people in their powerlessness. If there is some kind of, of strange upside, upside down way of defeating misery through misery. And that's as far as I can go. I think after that has to get, has to have the big mystery stamp uh, on the top of the page and, and say, be really careful how much you can presume to know about what that looks like. Uh, Carolyn, get ready. We're going back to John. I'm going to throw it to you. I think that's essential, Matt. 
because the incarnation by itself is only misery loves company and God joins us in our misery. It's got to be more, and it is, that in the cross, God is present in suffering, but in a way that God is beginning to overcome it, and God's preferred future, that is the ascension to the Father, which uh, Caroline was talking about in John, is already being present. Isn't that right, Caroline? Well, I, I, I think the the cross. Uh, I mean, this is where this is where I think what you're getting at, Rolf, is that uh, if the cross is only limited to solidarity with humanity, uh, although that's a huge piece of it, but the, or or points to the humanity of Jesus. Uh, there's something more going on here and that more going on. And, and as you said, the overcoming of that suffering, uh, perhaps, uh, and, and when that happens uh, is, is, uh, is the hard thing about being human, uh, but the promise, of, the promise of the resurrection and the promise of the ascension. And so there's this, um, the, the, the foolishness of the cross in part here, uh, or the even, or the wisdom of the cross is that it, uh, that it see that it's capable of seeing beyond the suffering, <laughs> that it, that there's, there's something more, um, that, that is, uh, that's possible and that God is at, at God, um, doesn't justify it, but God is at work in it to overturn it, uh, or uh, to be in it and to, and to, uh, to look forward. And so, um, that's where, that's where John's sort of larger, um, uh, perception of what the incarnation means and that, you know, that lifting up of meaning, uh, the whole meal deal, right. Uh, I think puts into perspective, um, what, what the cross, uh, what the cross can really mean for, uh, for the believer. And I, you know, I want to keep that yeah. open too. Like when I say mystery, I don't mean that we can't know, but I think that there's no one size fits all. I mean, this is the thing that always shocks me when I go back to, uh, James Cohn's The Cross and the Lynching Tree. That book could have been simply, I say simply, I mean, it could have been only, a way of talking about solidarity. It could have been a way in which the cross helps me realize I'm not alone. When he's able to still see redemption in the cross and liberation and freedom in that mm -hmm. through all of the context of lynching that he talks about, I just, I honestly sit back in awe at that and say, I can never approach that same kind of experience because it's not my own and it's his, but I, I kind of watch it in wonder uh, and it's so eloquent, right? Because it is this idea of of power that he still does see. I don't even know the right word to use. I'd say positivity. That's not. That's just, just not a great word, right? He sees he sees progress or salvation still occurring in that darkness for himself. I'm not gonna say darkness. He sees that in that misery for himself. That's profound. It's the um, I when you were talking about mystery earlier, uh, Matt. I was also keeping in line with the paradox that this is, um, and um, the commentator uh, makes mention of this: uh, the paradox of this powerful tool of execution becoming the symbol of eternal life. One of my students, Ryan Walsh, uh, Ryan Walsh. Um, uh, said it uh, in a statement a few years ago like this, Roman crosses don't always work. 